You guys into runes and shit? It's gonna be fun. Sitting around with time to kill. You are now watching Music the Life Floods Final Thursday. Hey guys, this is Dustin from Music the Lifeblood. Welcome to Vinyl Thursday. So, 2020, Lady Beast released an album, and my chronically behind ass has finally gotten around to listen to it. I'm always busy. I'm always busy with docking lately, salivating over Japanese docking albums, which more on that later. But this episode, we're talking about the Vulture's Amulet by Lady Beast. thing we need to address the back catalog lady beast is plus 10 years deep at this point they're a working band and they've been releasing material consistently throughout that entire time now we're going to dig into the vultures amulet but i want you guys before you do that to go back and check out some of the prior material specifically i want you to start with lady beast 2 i think that album was the point the band hit its full stride. Deborah's voice had grown into its full character and nuance, tight riffing, the propulsion of the drumming, just they're, they're firing on all four cylinders on that album. And then there's another one from 2017 called Vicious Breed. And that to me, it's the album out of the bunch that just rips the most. I think there's a lot of speed metal on that album. There's a lot of power metal. And it's just, it's a good sort of cross cut of what Lady Beast is about just overall. <laughs> As the Vulture's Amulet goes, the band is setting comfortably in their established compositional rhythm. They've got it down to a science. They absolutely know what they're doing in that regard. Now, that said, I think they've traded away some of the speed metal flourishes and exchanged that for more 
jaunts into overt power metal, in my opinion. There's times that this album gives me Dio vibes, Last in Line specifically. It's It just feels power metal-ish, in my opinion. And there's other times, too, that I was listening to it and I instantly thought of Paul Diano's post-Iron Maiden project, Battle Zone. Just... It would make sense. All three of those bands on one bill would, it just, that would make 100% sense to me. Battlezone, Lady Beast, and Dio. That would be an awesome lineup. That, yeah, that would be amazing. But anyway, with all that said, just because they're trading away some of those speed metal influences or speed metal passages, whatever you want to call it, it still retains a compelling nature. The band still has the ability to grab your ear, pull you in, and keep you locked in to what they're doing. still actively examining the band, picking them apart, analyzing them. You guys know how that goes with me. That said, yes, the new album influence is absolutely there. It is, it is overt. It is obvious for everyone that checks out this band. Now, that said, <laughs> in my opinion, when it comes to this trad metal boom that the United States is experiencing right now, the term New Wabam-ish, New Wabam influenced gets tossed out way too casually, in my opinion. I think Lady Beast are something more than just fans of Iron Maiden and the overall New Wabam. Now, I'm not 100% for sure, but if I had to make a bet, put a wager on it, I really, really think there's someone or some ones in Lady Beast that are intimately familiar with Thin Lizzy. And it shows in the guitar playing. And that's why I say when it comes to Lady Beast, they are more than just new Wobbum influenced. So to me, when I listen to them, if my ears perk up in the direction of something being as good as anything, Scott Gorham, Brian Robertson, or Gary Moore did, you're doing something right, in my opinion. So like I said, Lady Beast, yes, new album, it's there, but there is something more to this band. And I'm saying it's that idea, that sort of blueprint that Thin Lizzy had of this dueling guitars like we saw in Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and bands like that, obviously. But Thin Lizzy did it just a little bit differently than the the New Wabam scene, you know, the greater New Wabam movement, that sort of thing. Thin Lizzy was just this slightly different approach to melody, understanding how harmony interplays with different instrumentation, just all of those things. So when it comes to Lady Beast, Christopher and Andy, if it's you guys that are really into Thin Lizzy, you guys are absolutely doing something perfect on the nose. You guys, good Lord, excellent picking.
bass and drumming wise, amazing. Perfect rhythm section for this band. Absolutely outstanding. And I'll add to that. Everybody knows that I'm a huge Judas Priest fan. Love him. One of my favorites. Can't get enough of Priest. You know, we all think of Rob Halford, Glenn Tipton, K.K. Downing, and Richie in there, too, because I absolutely love Richie Faulkner in Judas Priest. Dude and Doc knocks it out of the park absolutely every time. He's incredible. Now, part of the reason that they can be such great focal points of the band overall, the albums, the songs, whatever, no one ever talks about the amazing support system that they have standing behind them, Ian Hill and Scott Travis. Part of the reason Priest is so amazing is because Scott and Ian as a rhythm section don't get in the way. They know when it's time for them to not be the focal point of the song. It allows the light to burn brighter on the other three guys. And I'll say, when it comes to Lady Beast, as a drummer, Adam, I can tell that dude is not playing to 100% of his technical ability, which means he's not showing off, which means he's servicing the song like Scott Travis would. And it it's just amazing to me one, when you run across a drummer that is very obviously much, much more technically skilled than what they're actually doing in any given song or project, a band, whatever the case is. It's always amazing to run across those drummers because you immediately grasp that there is a valid, 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 valid sense of appreciation for that member, for that drummer when you're listening to that band. He has his ego under control. He has his awareness of what his contribution is to the band. He understands where he best fills whatever thing the band needs him to take care of. And it's just, when it comes to metal, especially technical metal, you know, the proggy or tech death and, you know, the more overt musicianship focused kinds of bands in that regard that, when you come across a drummer that overplays, it wears you the fuck out. And it makes it harder to really, really sink your hooks into a song and be able to sort of carry it with you as an active fan of that band. So, Lady Beast, you guys have a really, really good drummer. But I'm sure you guys know that. So, cherish him. Treat him like a little pearl, a beautiful little pearl with a bandana and a mustache. lyrics and vocals. Deb. She's absolutely amazing. There's no other word for it. Absolutely outstanding performance by Deborah. Just killer with an exclamation point. Now, lyrics wise, 
My guess is that a big chunk of the lyrics are emanating from Deb. And I'm guessing that just based on the emotion that she puts behind it, the feeling, the oomph that comes behind these words. I feel like they have major meaning to her, regardless of what she's singing about. I think it's probably emanating from her. Now, that's just my educated guess. Now, they're dealing with the occult, runes, mysticism, all that sort of tried and true metal subject matter. But there's a bit of a ambiguous side to the lyrics where you could potentially deduce that, well, maybe she's talking about, who knows, a relationship, a life experience, whatever, that sort of thing. But it's delivered in a sort of metal vessel, the tried and true metal vessel. So lyrics wise, Lady Beast is interesting, especially as you comb through the back catalog as well. Now, vocally, I don't have a single complaint when it comes to Deb's performance on, I would say, nearly the entirety of Lady Beast's catalog. She's just absolutely stellar, stellar vocalist. And they don't muddy her production up with too much reverb to smear it over the top of the rest of the instrumentation, what the band's doing, it isn't overly produced to the point where, you know, it becomes dated, I guess would be a good way to put it. There's times when you listen to a lot of those early 80s metal albums and it's good Lord, please take that reverb off of that guitar or we do not need more delay on the vocals. Please stop. So in that sense, Deb's vocal production is relatively dry for lack of a better term. Now, Again here, I don't know for sure. I've never read an interview. I've never talked to anyone in the band about it. I've never listened to an interview, what, whatever the case is. But if I had to make an educated guess, I would put some money on that Deb probably has some Ronnie James Dio records in her collection. Whether it's Rainbow, Sabbath, Dio on his own, doesn't matter. Deb is pulling pages out of the Ronnie James Dio playbook, and she's executing it so fucking well. The way she elongates her vows, her clipping of certain words, if it's coming in the middle of a measure, she just has a very, very developed and nuanced voice that has so much character when it comes to how she contributes to the band overall. Now, one of the things that I always admired Ronnie James Dio was his, his breath control. When you listen to Ronnie James Dio give an interview, even towards the end of his life before he passed away, his speaking voice showed no signs of vocal fry. And that's because Ronnie knew how to technically sing in a way that wasn't going to degrade his voice. Now, we think of 1980 of him joining Black Sabbath. And here's a good example. I want you guys to check this out. Now, with that in mind, I want you guys to check out Deb's vocal delivery. With Deb's vocals and Ronnie's vocals in mind, think about that. As far as Deb's performance on this album, Deb is pure talent when it comes to vocals. Just top of the game, in my opinion. It's just perfect in that sense. She's able to 
maintain definition, especially on the exhale when you're running out of breath. A lot of singers tend to taper off towards the end. Just it's all character of a well-developed, technically proficient voice. And she's got the lyrics to really deliver the goods. As far as standouts, the title track, The Vulture's Amulet. The solo section along with the solo that comes after it, just pure dynamics, absolutely amazing songwriting. And Andy's solo is just fucking tasty. Now I fly in circles to connect to death. I escaped eternal rest with a vulture's amulet. Life and death it has begun. I've seen magic that hides behind the sun. closer vow of the valkyrie great harmonization between the guitars and deb and then on top of that just an overall sort of triumphant vibe to it it's one of those songs where you you know you got to get somewhere but you're going to do it on a horse and just shits on fire behind you it's just yeah absolutely triumphant song <laughs> favorite track currently is Betrayer. Love this one. Great lyrics, great vocals, awesome solo. There's a key change that's unexpected and just oodles of fun. I think, yeah, this is probably my favorite song on the album.
check out some pressing info and some tasty little nuggets of things that I found online. Nuggets. Tidbits. What kind of sauce do you put on tidbits? Okay, first thing up, let's take a look at the Lady Beast Bandcamp page. So this is their merch selection. I just wanted you guys to get a nice look at it. Just be aware of everything that they're carrying. They've got a lot of really good merch, especially when it comes to the albums, EPs, LPs that they've released. Just a ton of good stuff. They've been around over a decade, like I mentioned earlier, and they have a lot to show for it, in my opinion. Great stuff in here. Notice the uh, cassette right there. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it here in a minute, but... All right, so first thing up, let's check out. This is the sort of little advert, whatever you want to call it, on the Bandcamp page for the Vultures Amulet. So this is the one I have. 12-inch translucent purple heavy splatter vinyl LP. This was $21.99 plus whatever the shipping was. I don't think it was, I think it was like five, five or six bucks, I believe. Uh, I can't remember, and I don't want to look it up. Uh, but yeah. Awesome, awesome color scheme there. I'm really excited to show it to you guys. Thing just absolutely looks killer. So here's a little bit of the info again from the band camp on the actual page to the album, whatever it is. So 12 inch translucent purple heavy splatter vinyl LP limited to 300 copies on translucent purple heavy splatter vinyl with a two sided lyrics sheet. The Lady Beast logo on the cover is printed in gold ink. Includes unlimited streaming of the Vulture's amulet via the Bandcamp app. Plus, you get to download the FLAC file, whatever. So, there it is. 300. Bam. So, as of doing this episode, I think there was still some available. So, just heads up. Food for thought. All right. And then here's the cassette. Look at that. That's fucking badass. I love it when cassettes are colored, especially when it comes to metal, because, you know, metal tends to do really well with gaudy <laughs> coloring, you know, really over the top. Lots and lots of rich color when it comes to, uh, you know, just as far as like the palette bands are picking from. I just I thought this was super cool. It was eight dollars, 88 cents. Just yeah, cassettes are fun, making a huge comeback. And then there's the CD. So worth noting, there was a black release of this album as well. I checked the matrix numbers that are listed on Discogs and uh, compared it to the actual one that I have too. So it looks like both runs, the purple splatter and then the black, were probably done with the same pressing plates because the matrixes are the same as far as I can tell. Just keep in mind when it comes to Discogs that it's kind of like Wikipedia, so everybody gets to piss into the same pool. So, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, just be careful if you're an Uber collector and you're looking to get both versions of it. Uh, but just for my educated standpoint i guess my experience it looks like they were done with the same pressing plate so just heads up on that and as far as i know the black version is sold out as well now here's a little bit of good sort of marketing appearance uh this looks like it was the metal chaos magazine they did a, a nice little spread on the band it's um it's good it's cool show you um couple of pages from it so you guys can check these out there's a spread with the cover of the album it looks great just absolutely looks amazing and then a couple shots of the band there's another one <laughs> yeah look at that v look at that v was that a gibson yeah that thing's incredible it's amazing and then here's a great shot of Deb looking uh, like a Neanderthal woman, I guess. Just the fur in the power stance. Looks like she's about to rip some shit up. So that's awesome. And then I found this. I thought this was cool. Uh, too bad it's in German. 
sorry, can't read German guys, but it just serves a, you know, the point that the band is out there. Um, especially look, uh, you know, mag, as far as magazines, printed magazines at this point, they're still out there. Now they're not as cheap, you know, as what they were in the eighties and nineties, obviously, because, you know, it takes a little more effort to, to get print, to get printed media, to move these days, that sort of thing. So just food for thought, but thought this was an awesome kind of media appearance. I wish I could read the interview, but I didn't want to take the time to type everything into the translator search engine. And then heads up too, just in case um, you guys weren't aware, new bass player. That's Amy. She's great. I think she's got some pedigree in the Pittsburgh music scene, I believe. I might be wrong on that, but uh, yeah, seems like she's a good fit for the band, which that's great. So worth mentioning too, you know, the new addition of Amy as the bass player. Uh, this is the cover, I guess, for the Bandcamp release for a live stream that they did post pandemic. Uh, so I think this might have been Amy's first appearance live in a live setting with the band. So heads up on that. I listened to it. I, I watched it and I've listened to it because there's a video of it up on YouTube. Obviously, you can go check out. And then they actually put the audio on the Bandcamp uh, that you can uh, actually purchase it, which is totally sweet. $666.66, which <laughs> metal is cute. That's amazing. But anyway, yeah, it's a great performance too. Um, it, for all intent and purposes, it looks like Amy is going to be a good fit for the band. So uh, good for her, good for the band. That's totally awesome. All right, up next, I thought this was cool. Sort of, I mean, obviously it's related to the band, but uh, sort of a different thing altogether. So there's this, uh, it's this book called Masterpieces, and it looks like they do it annually, and it's just fucking badass band art covers of albums and stuff like that so i had never came across this i didn't know about it but really really cool i got to check out some of the sample pages i think i could have swear i saw them on amazon maybe i can't remember maybe some sort of an advert for it but i thought you guys might want to check it out so there's that's the i guess uh, that's an ad I'm, I guess, probably got put on social media, whatever the case is. And then I think there was two different covers of this thing. So there's the one with the dude on the horse. Heavy music artwork, Masterpieces 2020 Special Edition. So there's that. And then there was this one, too. And this one was creepy as fuck. 2020 Special Edition. So, yeah, it looks like there's a couple variant covers, maybe more. I don't know. But both of those are absolutely badass. And then here's a couple sample pages. Uh, so on the top there, Eccles, um, they've made an appearance on Music the Light Blood's Conversations from the Pit. That was one of my uh, best of 2020. That was one of my picks for best albums of 2020. So, oh man, that album is absolutely killer. Just amazing. And the, the nightmare theme of it, Greek mythology, that sort of thing. Um, don't know if I've ever talked about it on Vinyl Thursday, but I have night terrors. And the thing that I see in my night terrors looks an awful lot like <laughs> what's what's on the inside. Uh, I think it's on the, the lyric book, the, the front of the lyric book or the gatefold for that album. So it was real creepy having that album close up and knowing that it's sitting on my shelf uh, in the other room. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm think I'm still thinking about, uh, doing an episode on that album because it's just absolutely killer black metal. Just amazing. So I may do one, but I was, I think I'm a little hesitant because I, I think I'm a little scared that I'm going to provoke some night terrors by doing a full on episode of the album. So, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll cross that bridge one day, but yeah, a couple sample pages and then Here's the cover art close up. Give you guys a nice, long, deep look at it. Just killer. Killer. You know, I think everybody, you know, I've done, I think, yeah, two, two or three Vinyl Thursdays ago, I did the He-Man episode with the read-along book. 
Um, and everybody knows that I'm a huge master of universe fan or masters of the universe fan. Um, I post some of my pictures on the music lightblood Instagram every now and then when I sort of need a palate cleanser, when I need to let my ears rest, but yeah, yeah, this, this just incredible artwork, absolutely incredible artwork, definitely in the Frank Frazetta realm of illustration. You know, it's not polished the way that Boris Vallejo is, but I, you know, I prefer the sort of rough around the edges, Frank Frazetta type illustration. So this thing hits all the buttons as far as classic covers for metal album. What a badass piece of artwork. So with that in mind, the guy that did the cover art to this album, it's a dude named Adam Burke. Uh, this is his Instagram uh, profile. His handle is Night Jar Illustration. Night, N I G H T, jar like jar of jelly, I guess. J R Illustration. Uh, dude is just fucking amazing. Absolutely incredible illustrator. Painted and drawn by hand in Portland, Oregon. Commissions, inquiries, email nightjarburke at gmail.com. Fine art at Instagram, uh, looks like at Adam Burke art. Yeah, there you go. And then he has a big cartel store where he's selling his stuff. So I want you guys to take a look at that. This is the splash page or main page of his big cartel store. Um, that's going to be nightjarillustration.bigcartel.com. Um, I can't remember if I binged or Googled his name and something came up, uh, you know, I'm get, I, I came across, I think I came across some other artists with the same name, Adam Burke. Um, so it might be smart, smart to go to his Instagram and then hit the link in his Instagram profile and it'll take you to his big cartel. But uh, that first picture that popped up right there, it's called warden. Just jaw dropping jaw dropping his interplay with colors is i it's he's not um his his color schemes are never gaudy i don't i don't know how else to say that he's using sometimes muted colors with sort of flourishes of brighter stuff but not to the point where it looks cartoonish i suppose would be a good way to say it but those crows ravens whatever you want to call them right there man Derek would love this, my brother. You guys know Derek's an illustrator. I dumped, I think I sent him a link in our Music the Light Blood chat the other day so he could look at it. I know he's going to be into it. All right, so here's this other one. This one's from his, I believe it was posted on his Instagram. Writ, 16 by 16 inches, acrylic on wood. Original is available in my shop. Also available to license for $500. So, yeah, I think he knows he knows his own worth. That would make a great cover to an album. Good Lord. I don't know. Maybe that'd be an awesome, like, uh, maybe like a cover to a Gorgoroth album. That'd be awesome. Thing looks great. And then let's go through a couple more of these. I thought this, I don't think he had a title on this one. That's, is it a beetle, a scarab, maybe? Either way, it looks cool. Just looks like there's some watercolor in there, too. Looks like the red is watercolor. Oh, I thought this one was cool too. This one was really neat. This one's called Fantas. This one was 600 bucks. Looks like he sold it, but just super cool. I love those candles. I love the, the color play. It's awesome looking. And we'll do two more. I don't want to stay on this forever. But this cat one really caught my eye too. Looks like we got a witch on a broomstick back there. Was this called Noctflug Print? I think knocked is night, I believe. Not positive on that though. Still absolutely badass. Made me think of pets pet cemetery with uh church uh the cat Churchill, I think his name. It made me think of that. And then we'll do there's the actual cover of the album without the logo on it, so you guys can check it out. And it looks like it's up for sale too. I wonder how big it is. I didn't come across the dimensions of it. 
I should have checked, but I can tell you looking at the cover of the album, the cover of the album, it being on, you know, roughly 12 by 12, maybe it's been blown up. Maybe it's been shrunk down, but looking at the actual cover that I have, it doesn't look like it lost resolution. Um, so chances are his actual painting is, if I had to guess, it's probably bigger than the, the album cover. So just, you know, if you're going to shell out for this, it's going to have some size to it, but just a great, great cover. Amazing. Kind of reminds me of Ed Repka a little bit. I think Ed Repka is tilts towards the Boris Vallejo end of the artistic illustration spectrum. Ed has a, a glossy, a sheen to a lot of his stuff. But at the same time, too, I think it's because of the colors that Adam has used on here. It makes me think of a lot of Ed's artwork. You know, so if you could maybe Ed Repka's color palette meets Boris Vallejo's style of anatomy and, you know, way of drawing, that sort of thing. So, but man, oh man, is that thing freaking cool. Here's a, here's another look at his Instagram. So go check this guy out. Uh, it looks like he's selling prints of stuff too. And obviously prints are going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than what the actual original pieces are going to be. So if you want to put something like this in your, in your living room or hang it on a wall, or maybe have the band sign a print of his, who knows, you know, whatever, whatever works. So go check this guy's artwork out. It's night jar illustration. That's his handle on Instagram. His name is Adam Burke, B U R K E dude is absolutely phenomenal. All right. So next up, uh, just some flyers. I was looking through the band's social media and I saw some of the flyers that they had posted for prior shows. And you guys know how much I appreciate, uh, flyer art, you know, some of my, uh, some of the Gorgoroth pieces, you know, flyers that I have in my collection are some of my most favorite pieces of artwork. Um, a doom band, a doom stoner, whatever you want to call it, band called Year of the Cobra. I directed a video for them uh, a couple years ago. Um, they, uh, they, you know, they kind of sent me like a care package to say thank you. And they put some old flyers in there and some of their flyers, whew, man, their artwork. Good Lord. It's absolutely amazing. But here's this first one. I thought this was cool. Nice uh, kind of punk rock, high resolution, black and white vibe. We all know how well that works for aggressive music. Somebody's 25th birthday party. So that's awesome. And then here's this one again, high resolution, black and white always looks great. Lady beast, their logo is down there in the bottom left corner. Awesome looking flyer too. And then this one, you know, it's always, I mean, the joke of looking at, you know, extreme metal band logos, <laughs> And names, you know, the the harder the read, the more street cred you get, I guess. But, you know, these aren't too bad. This looks like it's probably all within like the speed metal, power metal, thrash, uh, maybe a little bit of death elements to some of the, the visuals for these band logos. Um, but it's, I just, this one was cool. Just thought it was really neat looking. And then I think this was the last one that I found. Yeah. Yeah, this one, it looks like it's a cut and paste sort of, you know, collage. You know, when you think of like the, the ransom letters in movies, you know, the cut out, cut out words and letters and stuff like that. So I just, yeah, this one was awesome. And then the last thing, <laughs> this, I, th this just caught my eye. I just thought it was funny. So this was on the Lady Beast uh, Instagram. Um, it's a picture uh, looks like Twiz and Deb, you know, doing their rock thing. Uh, but the comment, the comment down at the bottom of it was what made me laugh. So it's nice to see that bands have a sense of humor. But um, they posted this pic was taken right before George from Cloven Hoof spoke over the microphone about how good the, the, the lasagna was Deb made for their band at the show. Ha ha ha. He mentioned it like five times. The man loves lasagna. Hashtag Lady Beast official lasagna underground metal. So uh, <laughs> when I saw it, it made me laugh. I couldn't help it. I just thought it was I thought it was funny. So um, it's always great when bands aren't you know 
so self-important that they can't they can't have a laugh out in the open you know which you know there's a lot of bands that yeah they uh <laughs> the sense of humor doesn't make it to the surface very often but yeah i thought this was funny it made me laugh all right and then let's do just one last look at the cover of the album and just enjoy how fucking amazing that thing is All right, let's check this thing out. All right, first thing up, let's take a look at this mailer. I've already opened it, by the way. Uh, so this was released on Reaper Metal Productions. Make sure you guys go check them out, their band camp. They got quite a bit of stuff on there, obviously. And then um, it's label-wise, it's similar to what Hell's Headbangers is doing. A lot of underground stuff. True to the term, heavy metal, trad metal, whatever you want to call it. Um, I heard some interesting, you know, there was something on there yesterday I listened to and it was pretty crusty. But uh, yeah, so go check out Reaper Metal Productions for one. And then two, I just wanted to be able to show you guys the mailer that they had sent it in because I talk about packaging on Vinyl Thursday quite a bit. Uh, this mailer, it was good. Um, it's a... Uh, Nice and sturdy, rigid. It has these flaps on the inside that actually holds the LP in place to keep it from shifting while in transit. Um, yeah, it was a good mailer. No issues. The, the album arrived safe and sound. So just heads up. You know, if you're buying stuff from them, know that they're, they're not skimping on the mailer. They're, uh, thinking about the customer's best interests when it comes to making sure that their product is getting to them. So there's that. All right. Bam. This thing's amazing. Yes, I've already opened it. Uh, no, it was not shrink wrapped. It came in this dust sleeve. Um, I was kind of happy that it didn't get shrink wrapped because I'm, I sometimes feel like I just don't get, I, I would understand shrink wrapping it, especially if you're a bigger band and you have barcodes and you need to wind up in record stores and things like that. But when it comes to direct uh, to buyer, you know, mailing, purchasing, whatever you want to call it, that sort of thing, I just don't think shrink wrap is necessary. And I would imagine it probably saves money for the label and the band. So, I mean, that's good because it potentially puts more money in the pocket of the both the the label and the band so any way that they can cut costs without actually hurting the product or hurting its ability to arrive to the consumer safe and sound so yeah but anyway all right so look at this looks like uh reaper metal they uh they threw some stickers in there too so there's the hellcast that's the uh, podcast that they do and then there's just an awesome sticker. So these will probably go on the table. I don't know if you guys ever notice, um, I'm probably always standing in the way, but the, the front of the Music the Lightblood desk that I do everything on is covered in stickers. I've got like some of my old bands, Year of the Cobra, some Season of Mist. And so I'll probably stick them on there. But anyway, swag. All right. So let's open this thing up. Check out the cover, look at the LP, all that good stuff. So there's another look. Not a gloss finish, but not quite a matte finish. I forget what the term is. Somebody from, I think it was who released that last Savage Master album. Was that Shadow Kingdom, I believe? They had actually saw the post I had made on the Instagram for the episode and somebody that's working for Shadow Kingdom gave me the actual term of what the matte looking covers are called in, you know, stupid me. I forgot to check it and remember what the term was, but yeah, it was fun. It's always neat when labels and bands will you know, reach out and say, hey, we saw the episode. We like it. This is always nice to hear that kind of stuff. But anyway, so yeah, like I said, not a glossy finish per se, but also not a flat matte primer-ish looking finish as well. There's some, there's a little bit of a luster to it, but like I said in that Savage Master episode, I just, sometimes I think with the, the glossy covers, I think they don't wear and tear as well 
as the flat, non-glossy printed ones do. As they're easy to scuff. You know, you get spiral scuffs on them or pulling them out of the record shelf or whatever the case is. It just, I don't think they hold up as well. So, but then again, you know, I listen to a lot of black metal. <laughs> that was a joke. I don't know if you guys got it or not, but anyway. Um, yeah. Here's the back. Love it. Awesome picture of the band. Yeah, super cool picture of the band, too. I liked that uh, this, it, the, the font or whatever, you know, whatever. It looks like it's burnt, you know, uh, wood burning. You know, where you take a, a hot metal thing and you actually burn into the wood, whatever it is. I just thought it added to the layer of definitely to the, the sort of motif of the lyrics and subject matter and all that kind of stuff just looks super duper cool. Yeah. Nice little filter and enhancement of that photo too. All right. And then there's an insert. So let's check this thing out. This one was cool. I'm kind of curious who did uh, I believe there's a photo credit in here. I think it said Twiz. That's the rhythm guitar player. I think photos by Twiz. Yeah. Layout by Reaper. Yeah. So photos by uh, Twiz. I believe that's the rhythm guitar player. Dude is really good. I think he was, could have swore in that live stream, he was playing a V. I don't know if it was a Gibson or what was going on with it, but. I remember thinking, remarking to myself, it was fucking nice. <laughs> but anyway, uh, here's this lyric sheet. They got the thank yous down here. You know, they, they're listing some of the bands that they played with. So I saw Night Demon in there. Yeah. Night Demon, Savage Master, Destructor. Yeah. So they paid, they played with a ton of bands, which is cool. I like the, when it comes to the trad, metal true to heavy metal term I, whatever you want to call it the scene is um it's a friendly scene it's a oh god the, sort of inclusive in the sense that there's not just a bunch of assholes hanging around <laughs> causing a shitty time for everybody else you know, all of us who go to shows on a regular basis know that just once in a while there's a dick there and he's just being a dick that's what dicks do. They're just assholes. But, uh, yeah, I like the, I like the sense of community and, um, it's just a good dynamic. It's most people involved in this scene, bands especially, they all have really great disposition. They're approachable and, you know, they don't, uh, you know, they're not off putting in that sense. And, you know, when I did, I released that Savage Master episode um, a couple weeks ago, whenever it was. I got a nice message from uh, one of the guys in the band, which was it was cool to, to see that. So it's always great when good bands aren't assholes. You know, occasionally you get a really great band and they're just massive dicks. Uh, and that totally blows. But um, yeah, I like this scene. I like this scene of music because because I think there's. Uh, a lot of variety when it comes to musically within the trad metal scene. Uh, there's a lot of speed metal, a lot of, you know, proto metal stuff. There's thrash bands that could fit into it. There's, you know, at times like first wave influence death metal bands, you know, not necessarily straight up death metal sounding bands, but bands that have been influenced by you know, early death, death metal, you know, that sort of stuff. But the, the, just the entire scene, people seem to be getting along. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, whenever I read stories about, uh, the hardcore and punk rock scene of the early mid eighties, you know, a lot of those bands were establishing the sort of idea of DIY and self-promotion and self-management and stuff like that. 
Um, especially a lot of the stuff that emanated from the East Coast, uh, whether it was Minor Threat, Bad Brain, Scream, um, even the Misfits, you know, all of those bands, they all had a, a good sense of connection to the other bands. People got along, people talked to each other, you know, that sort of stuff. And I get that same vibe from uh, the trad metal, new wave of heavy metal, whatever the hell you want to call it right now. It's just, it's a... It's a good sense of community. That's the best way I can think to describe it. Let's see the other side. That's cool. I didn't want to I didn't want to spend a ton of time on lyrics for this episode um, because I think it can get a little too heady when I start dissecting lyrics. Um you know, I have to make myself less verbose when I'm doing Vinyl Thursday episodes. I have to make sure that I'm not, I don't, I don't want anybody to, you know, I don't, I want people to be able to watch Vinyl Thursday and understand quickly why I'm enthusiastic about something. And when I'm, when I'm overly verbose or, or, you know, throwing out big words and stuff like that, sometimes I think it just gets, eh, it turns people off sometimes. So that's why I didn't want to spend a whole bunch of time on the lyrics with this album because the lyrics are deep. They are heavy at times. And I think it's your best served sort of taking it in on your own and not ran through someone else's filter. That's why I didn't want to spend a lot of time. I wanted you to be able to, to get uh, something unique to you out of the lyrics you know, without my input sort of potentially clouding the water of what your perception or your interpretation or your reality of what you're getting, um, the meaning you're getting out of the lyrics, you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, but I will say, like I mentioned earlier, lyrically, the band is, it's varied, but there's a, there's a common thread that kind of gets woven through most of the album, and I would say most of their output in that mysticism, the occult, you know, stuff like that. But it's not um, derivative in the sense that it's just, oh, they're writing about the same old, you know, wizards and warriors bullshit. That's not what it is. I think there is, I think there's the sort of superficial interpretation, you know, the just a casual glance at what's going on with the lyrics, you could get something else. But as you dig into them and you start sort of that excavation process of interpreting someone else's lyrics, I think there is definitely um, deeper uh, meaning to what's going on. The difference between objective meaning and subjective meaning, you know, so um, it, it's there's a lot to dig into when it comes to Lady Beast. Kind of reminds me of Candlemass, the the chord that lyrically Candlemass sort of strikes with me. I think Leaf, the bass player, I think it's Leaf, the bass player at Candlemass seems to be the sort of creative uh, ground zero of Candlemass. I think he's the primary songwriter, the guy that sort of directs the creative direction of the band. And I got a... I got a real kind of candle mass vibe lyrically with Lady Beast over and over and over and over again, many, many times throughout digging into the catalog, which that's cool to me. You know, candle mass is absolutely in good company when it comes to the, the forerunners of what would become doom, you know, lyrically, obviously geezer Butler writing lyrics for black Sabbath. I think you could probably, you could throw out pentagram, you know, as a, as a potential pillar within doom, you know, that it's just when it comes to lady beast, like I said, there's deeper meaning and it's obvious even at a casual glance that there might be some different, different kinds of truth to what the, what's going on lyrically with the band. But yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to cloud your guys' in, interpretation and get in the way of, a song meaning something different 
to you than what it would have meant to me. So that's for the most part, that's why I tend to stay away from lyrics when I'm doing a vinyl Thursday, but good stuff. Good Lord. Good stuff. All right, let's check out the LP. The saying is great looking. You guys are going to absolutely love this thing. Black inner sleeve, by the way. I always love black inner sleeves, especially when it comes to metal. It just works. It feels right. All right, let's do the big reveal. Drum roll. Brrr. amazing I love it now the adverts had uh, a little more the purple was a little more prominent than I guess the I don't know, what is that prune <laughs> I don't I don't know what color that that is it almost looks like prunes or beets maybe but the, the in the advert the purple is a little more prominent I'll put a picture of it up on the screen so you guys can sort of compare it but I really like how this came out. I like the, when it comes to splatter vinyl, you know, whether they're using those pucks where it's the pellets and the, you know, the, the vinyl is sort of pre-placed within the puck or whether they're throwing in individual pellets into the press. I just like splatter effects because one, they're never it's like a snowflake. It's, it's completely unique. They're always different, every single one. And the thing I like about this one is that there's almost a, you know, the trans, the translucent quality of it. I'll put it up against a backlight because I know you guys like seeing them backlit and see what it looks like. But the translucent quality to this, once you have light coming through it, it enhances the splatter effect, the, the bluish purple, the black, it just, honestly, I like mine better than what was in the advert, as great as the adverts, uh, the one in the advert did look. So, and then we got an awesome custom label too. The black and yellow, it's, it's an interesting pairing with the purple prune, lavender, whatever the hell you want to call it. But, and then I knew you guys would think this was cool. Little uh, callback from the cover of the album. It just made it awesome. Just made it absolutely awesome. Super, super amazing looking. <laughs> I, I love it. I, lo I love this album. I love the entire package as far as the cover, the vinyl, the insert. It's just, they hit the nail on the fucking head. It looks incredible. Absolutely incredible. So, yeah. All right, let's do one last look at the sleeve cover. Man. Says everything you need to know about the album on that cover. I like the cut. I like this picture of the band. A lot of sass. A lot of sass in that photo. <laughs> A lot of attitude. <laughs> All right, and then. Look at the answer one more time. It's cool. Here's the other one. I'd like to interview the band. I'd, re I'd like to interview Deb specifically. I'd like to pick her brain on some just metal in general. If she is a Ronnie James Dio fan, I'd like to ask her about it. Dio was amazing. Ronnie James Dio would like this album. I'd, I'd put money on that. So if that's what you were shooting for, Lady Beasts, 
You guys hit the mark. Good job. All right. There it is. Guys, check this album out. Good Lord, it's amazing. So freaking good. I love the current state of metal. The current state of the union. <laughs> the metal state of the union. We're in good shape. So many genres. So many good bands. So much new music to talk about. It's just awesome. But there it is, guys. Lady Beast. The Vulture's Amulet. All right, guys, that's it for this week's edition of Vinyl Thursday. What's your favorite Lady Beast release? Let us know in the comment section below. This is usually when I would do the subscribe bullshit, but I'm just not in the mood to do it. So, yeah. Fucking subscribe if you want. It's up to you. Whatever. All right, that's it. Music the Lightblood, something old. Something new. Lady Beast. What are you listening to? Hey folks, don't forget you can support Music the Lightblood by buying some of our shit. Go to tchip.com and check out the MTLB Ultra Mega Store. Tons of fun stuff. Coffee mugs, t-shirts, hoodies, all kinds of shit. So you look cool for once. All right. Fucking merch. <laughs>